the power of the world, which provides the most comprehensive, up-to-date, and understandable insight into the current state of research into HD. And Professor... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, a very dangerous thing has happened, which is that I've been given longer than I expected, possibly as long as I'd like, which is <laughs> definitely not going to end well. Anyway, hopefully I will see. I've got a little county downy thing on my clicker uh, that will um, uh, either tell me when to stop, or I'll just, everyone will leave the room and I'll just be there talking to a room full of empty chairs. Um, anyway, I'm really grateful uh, to have been invited. It's uh, amazing to be here again, and um, whenever I speak for the for the, not the first time at a, a meeting like this, um, it encourages me to look back and, and I always think, well, people are going to be angry because we don't have a cure yet, and everyone's going to be like, well, you said we were going to have a cure, and you said we were going to have treatments, where are they? But whenever, then I sit down and I put the talks together, and I think, um, looking back since the last time I was here a year ago or two years, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's amazing to think what's actually new. So, um, quick straw poll. Oh, before I start, though. This is my original title slide. Um, I had to make one minor amendment, uh, which is that. <laughs> um, I was very sorry to lose my uh, putative wingman, <laughs> Professor Langemeyer. Uh, but what I've done is taken the opportunity, in light of the recent World Congress in Brazil, which Bernhard mentioned, to rename my talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brazil nuts. Great. So um, the timing is great because it's uh, less than a month since the World Congress. We heard lots of updates there, and also throughout the year there have been a lot of updates. So I'm going to um, hopefully draw attention to everything that's new. So hands up if you've heard me give a research talk before, please. And hands up if you've never heard me give a talk before. Perfect. So it's about half an hour, which is excellent. So there's something for everyone. Um, some of it, if you've heard me talk, some of what I say will be familiar because the fundamentals of, of my attitude to Huntington's disease and how we're going to fight it haven't changed yet, and probably won't. Uh, but what, what changes is what's new and what um, progress is being made in terms of specifics. So, there's three sections, possibly four, to, uh, to my talk. Uh, the first is I'm going to give you five big reasons to have hope. Before I do that, we'll talk briefly about what we mean by hope. And we've heard some reflections on the idea of hope and hoping versus intending, which I really love from Sarah. In fact, what's been amazing to me listening to the talks today is actually how we're all saying the same thing in, in slightly different ways and we're slightly coming at it from slightly different angles. Um, and I think the bottom line is uh, this is a problem that we can overcome together. And it's simply a question of how we maximize our strength and maximize our potential. So if you want to leave now, then I've said all I need to say. <laughs> so the first thing is five big reasons to have hope. The second thing is five specifics, my top five science things that are happening right now. And then at the end, um, then there'll be a short intermission where I show you one particularly cool thing. And I get to sit down because that's in the form of a video. And then finally, a few closing thoughts. Um, we also heard from Bernhard about mountains and fog. And he was very rude, I thought, about the Scottish Highlands, which uh, where, of course, the weather is always immaculate, and you can always have Holland to serve. Yeah. So Bernard and I differ slightly on where the fog is on the Huntington's mountain. To be fair, Bernard's actually stolen a lot of my imagery. Uh, so the, the various things that you come to, and you'll go, he stole that from Professor Lambermine, a cheeky young upstart. In actual fact, in many, if not all cases, it's still the other way around. Um, so we both agree that Huntington's disease and finding effective treatments for it is like a mountain. Where we differ, I think, is where the fog is. So his, he had the fog around the bottom of the mountain, but the top was clear. I think it might be more the other way around, in that we're somewhere in the middle of the mountain. We uh, have not yet reached the top, and we're also not quite sure where the top is. But it is the right thing to want to get to the top of that mountain, and we know we need to go up, and we'll get there. Um, my view on this is that it would be a bit daft to wake up in the morning and say, oh, there's a huge mountain, I'm not quite sure how tall it is. I think I'll walk up it. Right? I mean, that would not end well. Um, 
a, a, a more sensible approach would be, and this is one of the things that he stole from me, is to break the idea, and it's also something that Sarah said, which I'm sure she independently derived. Uh, breaking the journey down into steps. I mean, I can't, I certainly don't plan to be the first person to, I didn't invent steps. <laughs> um, but the idea of breaking the journey down into steps. Um, so keeping the goal in mind, keeping the top of the mountain in mind, but also then thinking about what is my next step? What, do I, what small thing do I need to accomplish to know that I have accomplished something that is heading in the right direction? The thing about Huntington's disease mountain is that there are actually lots of different sets of steps that all lead upwards. And some of them may not reach the summit. And occasionally, on one of these paths, we may go down one step. But that's OK, because there are plenty of other paths. And we can walk, you know, we sometimes come against obstacles and we can figure out ways around them. If we can't, we can use one of the other paths. And there's actually not just one person climbing this mountain, there's thousands across the world. And as soon as someone reaches the top, they're going to throw down a rope and help everyone up. So, um, on the subject of hope, because I know that, and I've heard this directly many times, people get a bit sick of hearing the word hope, that scientists and People have been saying hope, have, just have hope, just have some hope, have hope, have hope. And I think it's a perfectly good thing to have. But I agree with Sarah that there are things that are better than hope. And she used the word intend. We intend to come up with treatment for Huntington's disease. I intend to get to the top of that mountain, right? I mean, that's a, on the face of it, that's clearly a much more sensible thing than I hope to get to the top of that mountain. We need to intend, we need to map out the journey. So I always talk about what I call substantive hope or substantive hope, if you prefer. And this is the idea that you hope for the big thing, and that is your goal. But in order to reach the goal, you have to hope for lots of little things. So you break the journey down into little steps, and each step is a little nugget, a, a deep-fried Mars bar of, <laughs> of substantive hope. Um, and so that's what HD Buzz is. So HD Buzz is kind of... Uh, it epitomizes my way of thinking about the problem that we face, which is to say that um, I think for a long time there was a problem that scientists considered it sufficient to do research and publish it in academic journals and then go back to the lab. Um, and really that is a bit like you know the, those useless delivery guys who take the parcel all the way to your home and then knock so lightly that you know, <laughs> you're in the bath and you don't hear it, and then they put a letter through saying, I've tried to deliver it today. And then, so they've done 99% of the work, but because that critical last step of engaging with the customer is missing, you, it's as if the delivery never happened. And I think that that's what scientists have been doing for quite a while. Um, and we actually have a duty, it's the duty of scientists to explain our work to the people who need it. Because you need our research, but we need you. Um, we're doing this for you. We also kind of, we work for you, you know. You pay your taxes and your taxes pay for science. And, uh, you know, even if you're thinking about drug company research, it's, it's money from people's pocket that goes to the drug companies that pays for research. So ultimately, scientists work for you. And I think that you have the right to demand that scientists explain what they're doing to you. So that's what I'm doing. And that's what HP Buzz is about. It's science research news about Huntington's disease written by scientists in plain language for the global HD community. Um, it looks like this. The website is hdbuzz.net and we basically take science news and we break it down into steps. It's little nuggets of substantive hope and we um, explain it. And we don't stop there because it's, it, there's no point understanding the research without knowing what it means in real terms. So we'll always step back and say, how could this piece of research lead to a treatment? What could go wrong? What is needed next? What can people do in order to make that happen? So uh, we're as much about context as we are about content. Um, so that's the website. We also supply news in the form of a, uh, a news feed, a syndicated news feed. So any website that wants to can use our content free of charge. We're a registered charity and all our content is licensed under the Creative Commons license, which means that you can just use it, you don't have to ask us. Um, and you can also, this year, thanks to some um, additional funding from the Griffin Foundation, we've been able to upgrade our website. We can now 
produce PDFs of every story, which means that even if you're not online, what you can do is print off our articles for your support group or to, to have in your waiting room in the HD clinic or wherever you like, and that will then form a basis for discussing and keeping people posted. We're um, like well into social media, so uh, <laughs> we have a Twitter feed, Facebook, and we're increasingly posting videos on YouTube, so uh, we're all you know, savvy. Okay, so I need to extend a big thanks to the Scottish Huntington Association, who are were one of our earliest uh, supporters and continue to support our work. They're also huge trailblazers, by the way, leading the way, as we've heard, in terms of their approach to care and research. And, and um, it was uh, the SHA has, has set the example for everyone in the world in terms of engaging with young people, which is going to make a huge difference. It's making a difference already. So, five big reasons to have hope. Firstly, and this is a controversial statement, but I do stand by it, Huntington's disease is the most curable, incurable brain disorder. So this is quite a good way to divide a room, um, because there are plenty of um, people who hate the word cure, and there are plenty of people who hate the word incurable. Um, here are my thoughts. Uh, Whenever you look at an academic paper on Huntington's, the first paragraph almost always begins, Huntington's disease is an, a devastating, inherited, incurable brain disease, the words to that effect. But you could look at many things in that way if you wanted to. You could say, you know, the common cold is a devastating, incurable nose disease. Uh, but we choose not to. We choose to focus on the positives and say, um, this is something that we can get through and we can manage the symptoms. And we live with it. On a more serious note, diabetes, HIV, these are not curable conditions, but they're conditions where a combination of strength of spirit and medical advance can and do make a huge difference. Okay. And I think this is, and Bernard mentioned this this morning, and it's worth reiterating, there's a lot that we can do already. And yes, Huntington's is incurable, um, but I believe that it is possible to cure it, or it will be, and we intend to cure it. Um, why do I think it's curable, though, when we can't cure HIV and we can't cure diabetes? What we have in HD, I mean, think of other brain diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Those are 10 or 100 times more common than HD, and we can't cure them despite the money that's poured into them. Why Huntington's? The, the answer is the gene, the HD gene, discovered 20 years ago, um, and from that day on until now, and for the forevermore, we now know the cause of Huntington's disease, and it's the same cause in everyone, same gene in everyone. Everyone who has that mutation in that gene will get Huntington's at some point. <coughs> everyone who has Huntington's, it's because of that mutation in that gene. Now that's a big problem, but we know what the problem is, and that is not true of people working on Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, even diabetes. We know the problem is that the pancreas doesn't work properly. Why doesn't it work? Nobody knows. Multiple sclerosis, what causes that? Nobody knows. It's incredibly difficult. That's like not knowing where the mountain is. We know where our mountain is, and we know basically where the top is. We can't see it, but we know where it is. So what that does, I mean, I'll put some substance on that. What that does is it gives us complete certainty as to what the cause of the problems is. Not just in general, but in every cell in our bodies, we know what the cause of the problems is. And so if, if we observe something in a, in a patient or in a mouse that's unusual, if we cannot link it back to that faulty gene, we know that it's not relevant. And a lot of science is getting rid of things that we don't need to focus on or that we shouldn't be focusing our efforts on. In Alzheimer's disease in the past 10 years, tens, hundreds of millions of pounds have been spent on clinical trials of treatments that were developed for uh, theories of how Alzheimer's <coughs> works and theories of what the problem is in Alzheimer's disease. And all of those trials failed. There isn't a treatment for Alzheimer's. And basically now the pharmaceutical industry is admitting that's because we don't know what the cause of Alzheimer's is. And a lot of people, a lot of the reason why the drug companies are now turning to Huntington's disease is because we do know what the cause of our disease is. And we can work from that cause 
and map a very sensible pipeline, another word I borrow from Sarah,